Let's talk about eccentric overload training and its impact on muscle size and muscle strength. Hey guys, it's Holly here and welcome back to my channel. So today we're diving into one of the most practical and debated questions in strength programming, which is how often should you train to build muscle and strength? Now, is it once a week, twice a week, maybe even three times? Well, let's talk about it. Now, this isn't just a casual gym bro debate, as training frequency often affects our recovery, fatigue, performance, and long-term strength and muscle gains. And with more advanced training methods like accentuated eccentric loading making their way into more and more training programs, the stakes suddenly become even higher. And you guessed it, a brand new 2025 study looked at exactly this topic, which is how training frequency impacts strength, size and muscle fiber adaptations when using heavy eccentric overload squats in trained athletes. So let's break down what they did, what they found, and how it could shift the way you think about your weekly programming. So starting off with a quick definition of accentuated eccentric muscle contractions, well, this is simply when a muscle lengthens under load. And this type of muscle contraction is known to produce greater mechanical tension, muscle damage, and force output than concentric muscle contractions, which is basically when a muscle shortens as it contracts to produce movement. But most of the time, traditional approaches don't fully take advantage of this. Instead, you're limited by what you can lift concentrically, meaning that the eccentric phase often goes underloaded. Now, that's where accentuated eccentric loading, or AEL, comes into play. It's a method that allows lifters to lower more weight than they can lift, providing a unique hypertrophic and strength stimulus that isn't constrained by our concentric capabilities. Studies on accentuated eccentric overload have previously shown that it can lead to equal or superior gains in strength and muscle mass when compared to traditional training methods, especially in well-trained individuals. But eccentric training is also more taxing. It demands more from the nervous system, it creates more muscle damage, and it may extend our recovery time. So here's the real question. How often should you include eccentric training to maximize results without compromising recovery? Well, that's exactly what this study set out to answer. The goal of this study was to compare one, two, and three weekly sessions of accentuated eccentric overload squat training over a 12-week period, using the same structure every session, meaning the same reps, sets, and intensity. The idea was to isolate how frequency alone, not the workout content, affects performance outcomes and muscle adaptations in trained lifters. They measured three types of strength, concentric, eccentric, and isometric, as well as jump power, muscular endurance, muscle size, and even muscle fiber type composition from muscle biopsies. So let's take a look at the methods. What did the researchers do? This was a tightly controlled 12-week training study with 23 resistance trained men, each with at least one year of barbell experience and a minimum of a one and a half times their body weight squat. The participants were then randomly assigned into one of three groups. Group one included one accentuated eccentric loading squat session per week. Group two included, as you guessed, two eccentric loading sessions a week. And group three included three eccentric sessions per week. Each training session consisted of five sets of four repetitions of these eccentric overload squats. Now the eccentric loads started at about 1.1 times the participants concentric strength and this increased by two and a half percent on a weekly basis while the concentric loads were set at around 50 percent and this was using a custom machine that was designed to separate these different loading phases. The participants were instructed to use a three to four second eccentric tempo with a constant lowering velocity velocity and to use their normal squat lifting velocity during the concentric phase. To keep the results as controlled as possible, participants didn't perform any other lower body resistance training during the 12-week study. All their lower body work came solely from the eccentric overload squat sessions. Now they were allowed to train their upper body but only if it didn't interfere with recovery and those sessions weren't part of the study protocol. To assess progress, the authors used a combination of lab and gym-based tests. Starting with strength testing, this included maximum concentric, eccentric, and isometric squats. For power, this involved a jump squat and a counter movement jump. 
For endurance, this was assessed performing reps at 70% of their one rep max, and muscle hypertrophy was measured via CT scans of the quadricep and the full thigh. And finally, muscle fiber type was taken from the vastus lateralis using muscle biopsies. Beyond this, weekly performance check-ins were conducted to monitor the participants' recovery as well as their progress. So now to the good stuff, what did the authors find? Well, after 12 weeks of eccentric overload squat training, all three groups, whether they trained one, twice or three times experienced meaningful improvements across nearly every measured outcome. Starting with strength, the concentric squat strength increased by about 9% on average, which translates to about a 15 kilogram increase. Eccentric strength improved even more by roughly 14%, while isometric strength rose by about 9%. In terms of muscular endurance, the participants improved significantly with a 29% increase in strength endurance as measured by the total number of reps they could perform at 70% of their one rep max. These are notable changes, especially considering that all the participants were already resistance trained at the start of the study. Jump performance, which was assessed through squat jumps and counter movement jumps, improved modestly with increases in the range of 4 to 7%. While they're not as dramatic as the strength gains, these changes still reflect positive adaptations in neuromuscular power. A handy data to know about for anybody listening who plays basketball or does any other sport involving vertical and lateral jumping. When it came to muscle size, quadriceps cross-sectional area increased by about 3.6%, while the total thigh cross-sectional area grew by approximately 2.1% based on CT imaging. These gains in hypertrophy were fairly consistent across all groups. Now, the only statistically significant difference between the groups was found in the concentric strength. The group that trained three times per week gained significantly more concentric strength than the group that trained only once per week. However, there were no significant differences in hypertrophy, endurance, jump performance, or any strength metric between the one, two, or three day group. And lastly, muscle biopsies showed a shift in muscle fiber composition across all groups, specifically an increase in type 2A muscle fibers and a decrease in hybrid and type 2X fibers. Now, this fiber type shift is often associated with improved strength and power output, but no group showed any clear advantage over the other in this specific adaptation. So to summarize the results, all groups, regardless of training frequency, improved across nearly every domain, but only one outcome, which was concentric strength, showed a frequency dependent difference with three days outperforming one. Otherwise, the adaptations were strikingly similar. So what do these results actually tell us? Well, first, accentuated eccentric overload training is an effective training modality, even at lower frequencies. A single weekly session was enough to significantly increase strength and muscle mass in already trained individuals. And that's really encouraging for lifters with limited time in the gym or for those requiring a recovery focused period. Second, more isn't always better, at least not in this context. Even though the three times per week group did triple the volume over 12 weeks, they only saw one advantage, and that was slightly greater concentric strength. For everything else, the differences were minimal or non-existent. And this may reflect the fatiguing nature of accentuated eccentric overload training. Since this creates more tissue damage and neuromuscular stress, adding frequency doesn't necessarily mean you'll be getting more benefit. You may just be increasing your recovery demands. However, it's also important to note that there was no traditional training condition to compare to, which could help confirm whether or not higher frequency training would be beneficial if the training didn't include eccentric overload work. On the same token, it's also worth noting that strength gains were modest, but meaningful, especially in a trained population. A 9% strength increase in already strong athletes is actually pretty impressive. Now, regarding the muscle growth data, the protocol consisted of five sets of just four repetitions, which is not really what would be considered traditional hypertrophy training. But despite this, muscle growth was still observed, and perhaps this was due to the combination of eccentric overload and the slow controlled repetitions increasing the total time under tension. Now, before we draw any hard conclusions, it's important to acknowledge the study's limitations. First up, the sample size was small, just seven to nine participants per group, which does limit the statistical power. Second, there was no traditional resistance training control group, so we don't know how these outcomes would compare to good old regular squats. 
And third, the study lasted just 12 weeks. In trained athletes, hypertrophy and fiber type shifts might actually require slightly longer timeframes to diverge clearly across training frequencies. And finally, while the session dose was equal across groups, the training volume was not, which in my opinion makes the lack of stronger differences between groups even more intriguing. All that being said, these factors mean we should interpret these results as suggestive, not definitive. So what are my main takeaways? Overall, this study suggests that when it comes to eccentric overload training, you don't need to train multiple times a week to see real progress, at least not in the short term. Even one high quality session per week using accentuated eccentric overload led to increases in strength, power and muscle size in already trained individuals. Training more frequently didn't result in clear additional benefits, with only one strength metric showing a significant difference in the concentric phase of the movement. This makes accentuated eccentric overload a highly efficient training method when applied properly, but it also highlights the need for smart programming. With advanced techniques like this, recovery matters just as much as the stimulus. So for all of you who are training for strength and muscle growth, how many days are you training right now? And do you believe one hard session a week with eccentric emphasis is enough to drive progress? Or do you think higher training frequencies are needed? Let me know in the comments. Now, if you found this breakdown helpful, make sure you hit the like button. Please subscribe to my channel and share this video with your coach or training buddy who has experimented with frequency and eccentric overload training. Now, if you're looking for more evidence-based programs or coaching, please check out my website. All the details can be found in the description below and until next time, train hard, recover harder, and stay evidence-based.